that are out there. Um, we have digital cards that you'll see in front of us. They're actually not digital, they're cardboard, but we call them digital because they have that QR code on it. And if you scan that code with your phone, it'll take you to the church website. There's a lot of stuff on the church website. There's these announcements, there's different ways to give, there's sermon notes, all kinds of things. So you can know all about what's happening in, in both community and church. And there's also a uh, connection card that you can fill out electronically if you want to uh, just let us know that you're visiting with us or um, if, if you'd like to send in a prayer request or anything like that. Wednesday night Bible study, we're starting at 6 o'clock. Uh, we're continuing with the discipleship series. I hope to see you there. Reading through the Bible in a year. Um, in the upcoming weeks, you're going to be reading a lot about David in the Old Testament, which is, he's one of my favorite characters, and uh, about his life and, and how he became king and all that. Thank you to everybody who's been helping out with all the different projects. You, you're, I'm sure outside, if you haven't been here for a few weeks, it's a lot, there's a lot that's different right now, and, and it's all going in the right direction, and we're very hap happy about that, and thank you, thankful for all who have helped. Oh, there we go. Memorial Day is coming up tomorrow. We got to get back here a little bit. Okay, we seem to be having a little bit of problems. Candy needed. We're still collecting candy. Yeah, through, today. through today, if you bring candy after tomorrow, it's going to be too late. And I think Jackson's going to get all the extra candy, right? <laughs> Okay, again, not really hard stuff because we don't want to hurt anybody. Don't want to put an eye out. Uh, Memorial Day Parade, that's going to be tomorrow as well. Um, there's a cookout down at, uh, down at Veterans Park. And um, we're, are we all set, Mike, on people covering? Okay, but we can always use more, right? Okay. All right. So even, even though we have things covered, if you'd like to help out tomorrow uh, with the parade, there's a sign-up sheet in the Connections Cafe, and we'd be very appreciative of that. Yes? What, what time tomorrow? What time we meet? Nine thirty. Uh, men's Bible, bre uh, Bible breakfast, <laughs> men's Bible study, breakfast, and bro time uh, will be meet meeting next Saturday. We're going to start a new series on Ephesians, so we hope to see you there. And now we have Devos with Grandpa Pipes. Today's title is Grow in Grace. 2 Peter 3.18 says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Peter concludes the second epistle very suddenly with two recommendations. One is to stand true. The other is to grow strong. The believer is to stand true by keeping his spiritual guard. He is to watch out for false teachers, scoffers, and mockers, lest he be led astray and stumble. To neglect to remain steadfast is to invite uh, defeat. Failing to go forward with, forward with the Lord will result in retreat into evil practices. Until Jesus comes, the Christian is to be steadfast. He is to move with purpose and determination in the direction of the way of the Lord. He is to depend on Christ alone for growth and progress in Christian living. There is no standing still in the Christian life. The believer is either progressing or regressing. Someone has said the Christian life is like riding a bicycle. Unless you keep moving, you fall off. The believer will grow in the direction that he addresses himself. The Christian life is a life of development in getting to know at an ever greater depth the Lord Jesus Christ. In that maturing process, 
of the indwelling Holy Spirit, there is growth in all God's provisions for living his ways. Spiritual maturity is a process in which there is always room for further development. Spiritual maturity is the best antidote and insurance against being deceived by the false doctrines or teachings. There is little a believer can do for the Lord unless that believer takes time to be with the Lord. Someone has said, to grow tall spiritually, a man must first learn to kneel. In the light of the soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ, every believer needs to be on his knees and on his toes. Why don't we turn to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you for this beautiful day and, and the meaning of Memorial Day, <clears throat> remembering those who gave the ultimate sacrifice for our country. Thank you for everybody who is here today, as well as those listening online. And just in the next coming months with all the travel going on in the area, please keep people safe as they come to uh, the Lake George area and then return home. Thank you for all the opportunities we've had uh, to serve our community and, and that we continue to serve. And thank you for all those who helped out in the various projects around the church. And, and we're just very, very thankful for that. Thank you for the Bible and all of the promises that it has and help us to continue to stand true to you and, and grow strong in our faith. Please bless the youth and, and men's and women's groups. Um, help them to, all, all those who are involved, help them to mature and keep, keep, keep the youth safe over the summer. Please be with our missionaries, both um, abroad and at home. Help them to be effective um, witnesses for you. Thank you for our church and, and all the growth that we've experienced, and please help continue that. Uh, continue to grow. Bless Pastor today as he comes and speaks to us. Help us to um, gather something from the sermon that he's going to present to us today. Help us to honor you in all that we do. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. I just want to add my gratitude to um, what Steve has already said about Memorial Day weekend. And, and the reason that we celebrate it is because um, men and women throughout the years in our military, um, different military positions have given their life, have sacrificed their life. Um, and let's stand together and worship. I'm going to read from John 15, 13, as you stand. Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus made it all, all to him I owe. Sin Lord, now indeed I find Thy power and Thine alone Can change the leper's spots And melt the heart of stone Jesus paid it all For nothing good have I Whereby thy grace to claim I'll wash my garments white In the blood of Christ 
Calvary's Lamb. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. I stand in him complete. Jesus died my soul to save. My lips shall still repeat. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. have a lot to be thankful for, not only for the sacrifice of our military, but also for the sacrifice of, of our Savior, of Jesus Christ. Um, Revelation chapter 5, verses 11 through 13 say, Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who is slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise for who can stop the lord almighty our god is the lion the lion of judah he's roaring with power and fighting our battles every knee will bow before him our god is the lamb the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world his blood breaks the chains every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb oh every knee will bow before him so open up the gate Make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before him. Lord. 
And I read something recently, I can't remember where it was, but how that with that, the words, the lion and the lamb, how he is 100% lamb and 100% lion. It's not 50% or 60, 40 or anything like that. Our God is fully um, powerful and strong and fully the lamb who was willing to lay down his life for us. Um, and also willing to go with us through hard times. Isaiah 43, 2 says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. There's a grace when the heart is under fire. Another way when the walls are closing in. And when I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. There was another in the fire standing next to me. There was another in the waters holding back the seas and should i ever need reminding of how i've been set free there is a cross that bears the burden where another died for me there is another in the fire for dead beneath the waters I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore and should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning either way I won't bow to the things of this world and I know I will never be alone. There is another in the fire standing next to me. There is another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding what power set me free? There is a grave that holds nobody, and now that power lives in me. There is another in the fire. Oh, there is another in the fire. Oh, there is another in the fire. the name that is Jesus he who was and still is and will be through it all 
So come what may in the space between all the things unseen and this reckoning. I know I will never be alone. I know I will never be alone. There'll be another in the fire standing next to me. There'll be another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding how good you've been to me, I'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be There is another in the fire Oh There is another in the fire Oh There is another in the fire Oh There is another in the fire I'm getting a little emotional, guys. <laughs> Let's see if we can get through this last song. Praise the Lord for his ability to be with us through the hard times. And because of the fact that we know we can trust him, we can say the words of this next song. Grander earth has quaked before Moved by the sound of his voice Seas that are shaken and stirred Can be calmed and broken for my regard Through it all, through it all my eyes are on you through it all through it all it is well through it all through it all my eyes are on you it is well with me Far be it from me to not believe Even when my eyes can't see And this mountain that's in front of me Will be thrown into the midst of the sea Through it all, through it all my eyes are on you through it all through it all it is well through it all through it all my eyes are on you it is well it is It is 
the Lord. Heavenly Father, I pray for this day. I hope we can have a nice time. And I pray for those who are sick, and I pray for those who are traveling, and I pray for Miss Dorothy that her legs feels better, and I hope that everybody at BCC can have a nice time in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. Welcome. It's a busy day today, and thankful that if you found a parking spot, um, the next renovation project will be to try to figure out how to build a garage on top of the church here, parking garage or something. We need, it's crazy, but we, are, we appreciate you all bearing the traffic and everything like that. You see on the screen, we, our missions moment was Arthur and Lucy Yang from South Africa. And due to my limited capabilities in tech, I could not transfer their video from my cell phone to the computer, so I apologize for that, but we will post it onto our Facebook page. Um, they give a quick two-minute update of what God is doing in South Africa. Um, one of the greatest things that we have is that three of our teens from the Next Gen group are going to be going to South Africa starting July 2nd to the 16th, uh, 15th, 16th, something like that. Um, but they will be there for two weeks. They will be serving in orphanages. They will be helping run some camps and uh, stuff like that. And Arthur and Lucy were gracious enough to do a video, but uh, on their way to a Dare to Share ministry of conference that their Word of Life has partnered with. And uh, like I said, I could not figure out how to transfer it onto the big computers, so I apologize. But we will make sure to have that. But just pray for their ministry. Arthur and Lucy... Uh, you know, they both came to Word of Life when I was a dean. They got, I got to pour into their lives. I got to see where they are, and they have come down to the point where they are the directors of Word of Life South Africa for that whole region. And you can see God is doing great and mighty things through them and with them. So just pray for them if you don't mind. Um, I think... Yeah, I think you're going to need to do it, baby. I think our batteries are maybe dying here. So just advance it. So today is Memorial Day. We, we talk about remembrance, and remembering is an important part of our lives. 
All of us suffer from not remembering things, especially as we get older. My memory is, but my memory is filled with mental videos, both good and ugly. And I'm sure yours are too. God gave us, made us to have memories. The nation of Israel had several occasions that would help their country remember their journey as the Israelites left their slave places in Egypt. They were commanded to begin with the Passover meal. The blood of the sacrificial lamb was to be sprinkled on the Jewish doorsteps so the firstborn son would be saved from slaughter. They stopped at the mountain to receive the 10 basic commandments that would guide these former slaves to form a nation. They built an elaborate worship tent called the tabernacle to develop for them to the practice of worship. At the edge of their promised land, they discovered they would have to fight to occupy the land and voted not to attempt it. They wandered into the wilderness for 40 years until all those voted no would die and the younger generation was ready to fight for their promised land. And as their new leader, Joshua led them to the promised land. They built a significant memory place. They built a memorial containing 12 stones on the river uh, side where they exited in, in the riverbed before the waters allowed them to flow again. We see that in Joshua 4, 1 through 9 and 20 and 24. We as a nation have memory places, places that help us remember our heritage and the price that have been paid for our freedom. Civil War backgrounds like Gettysburg and Shiloh speak of the cost of war among ourselves. In fact, Memorial Day was established after the Civil War ended. And we, then we visit such places like Plymouth Rock and Valley Forge and our latest memorials, the Vietnam Memorial and the 9-11 site. These memory places help keep us keep balance of the ups and downs of democracy. Our faith has important memory places to mentally visit. Our experience of accepting Christ as our Savior and our baptism is an essential memory place to revisit. Our steps of growth towards maturity and our memory of times of rich blessings and painful mistakes remain important in our life. There's an old song written as a folk song in the early 19th century, which expresses our longing for personal memory places. Precious memories, how they often flood my soul in the stillness of midnight. Precious sacred stone scenes unfold. As I travel on life's pathway, not knowing what the years may hold ahead for me, and as I ponder, hope grows fonder. Precious memories flood my soul. This Memorial Day allows us to reflect on our own memory places. Memory places, to me, contain the things we value, the parts of our lives that really matter. We have valuable people memories, reflections of the persons who have invested in our lives. I look at Pastor Bubar. He never served in man's army but he certainly did a great job in God's army. I look at my father who served in World War II. One of the best patriots I ever sighed, the privilege of launching. I remember growing up in the VFW halls and the American Legion halls of Vermont, listening to the veterans of old tell stories of their time at combat. At that young age, I just looked at them as stories, but as I've gotten older, I noticed those weren't stories. Those were battle wounds. And there are many, and there are personal memory places that we have, some that are extremely painful, some secrets, but all to only you. The cost of caring and not disclosing them has been a costly burden for all of us. Some of our painful memories have been shared and others have been benefited from the witness of our dark sides. Some of our memory places have been significant to ourselves and others. There are about hard steps we have taken, wounds we have endured, lessons we have learned, changes we have made to keep moving forward in God's direction. There are also memories of our marriages, 
children, careers, responsibilities, and visions that we have embraced. We are thankful for all these memory places. They're essential to our Christian life. They give us direction in life. And as we are, line up our present life in keeping with the direction that we chose in the past, they also bring us a perspective in our lives. We gain a sense of importance of our past. And we recognize that some things have no lasting value. They bring us to a sense of purpose today in keeping with our yesteryears. They also prompt us to keep moving to a destination of life that has ultimate value to us. So Memorial Day, which was originally called Decoration Day, is a day of remembrance for those who have died in our nation's service. There are many stories to its actual beginnings with over two dozen cities and towns claiming the right to being the birthplace of Memorial Day. There's also evidence of organized women's group in the South that were decorating graves before the end of the Civil War. There were hymns that were published that substantiate this. There is one hymn that has a dedication to the ladies of the South who were decorating the graves of the Confederate dead. So I propose to you that it's not important who was the first to celebrate Memorial Day, but what is important is that Memorial Day was established. Memorial Day is about coming together to honor those who gave their all. What we do know about Memorial Day is it was officially proclaimed on May 5th 1868 by General John Logan, the national commander of the Grand Army of the Republic, in his General Order Number 11. It was first observed on May 30th of 1868 when flowers were placed on the graves of Union and Confederate soldiers at Arlington National Cemetery. The first state to officially recognize this holiday was New York, and it was in 1873. By 1890, it was almost recognized by all the northern states. It is now celebrated in almost in every state on the last Monday of May. In 1915, Mona Michael wrote a poem in Flanders Field. She wrote, We cherish too the poppy red that grows on the fields where valor led. It seems to signal the size, the skies, that blood of heroes never die. Traditional observance of Memorial Day has diminished over the years. Many Americans today have forgotten the meaning and traditions of Memorial Day. I know growing up with my father, Memorial Day, we would be out at every store passing out poppy seeds, the little poppy flowers, giving them out, and people would get donations. And we would wear those proudly. You don't see that anymore today. At many cemeteries, the graves are fallen and they're increasingly ignored and neglected. Yesterday, we spent with Jackson and a few others from the American Legion and here in the church family, we put out four gross of American flags. And as Mr. Paul educated Jackson and I, there's 144 in each gross. That's 576 American flags we laid just in our own cemetery down the road here. But many graves have, like I said, fallen, increasingly ignored and neglected. I remember when we were growing up, we would go to the things and we'd polish them. And I look on the Facebook page and I see family members. I see Ray and Lisa yesterday. They went to their grave sites of their loved ones to take care of them, to make them look nice. There are a few exceptions, you know, but about the ignoring of things, there are the few. Since the late 1950s, on the Thursday before Memorial Day, the 1,200 soldiers of the 3rd U.S. Infantry placed small American flags on each of the more than 260,000 gravestones at Arlington National Cemetery. Then they patrol 24 hours a day during the weekend to ensure that each flag remains standing. According to an article written by Chris Kozowski, 
The 3rd U.S. Infantry, known as the Old Guard, is the oldest regiment in the regular United States Army. The 3rd U.S. Infantry also has the deployment to stand watch over the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier 24-7 in all kinds of weather. In a message spoken by George, President George W. Bush on May 26 of 2003 at Arlington National Cemetery, he said, Through our history, America has gone to war reluctantly because we know the costs of war. And the war on terror we're fighting today has brought great cost of its own. Since this hour this nation was attacked, we have seen the character of these men and women who wear our country's uniform as they fought battles to achieve victories. These veterans of battle will carry them with them for all their days, the memories of the ones who did not live to be called veterans. I'm sure most of you recognize the bugle call that's played at ceremonies all over tomorrow. It's called TAPS, and we'll hear it on the news time and time again tomorrow. The origin of TAPS dates back to the Civil War. In 1862, Union General Daniel Butterfield and his brigade were camped at Harrison's Landing in Virginia following the Seven Days Battle near Richmond. At the time, the standard method of signaling a lights out to encamped troops at the end of the day was the, by a bugle call followed by three loud taps on a drum. But General Butterfield was dissatisfied with that and thinking that the last sound the men heard at night should be more soothing and calming, he rewrote the bugle call and eliminated the sound of the drum. After he had his brigade bugler play it for the men, buglers from all other units became interested and quickly spread throughout the Union Army. And he even caught on with the Confederates. Then in July, while they were still encamped at Harrison Landings, a corporal named Captain John Tilball, Battery A, 2nd Artillery, died of his wounds. Captain Tilball wanted to be buried wanted to be buried him with full military honors, including the traditional firing of three rifle volleys over the gravesite. But he was refused permission because it was feared that the Confederates might mistake the rifle fire as the beginning of an attack by the Union Army. Tidball later wrote, so the thought suggested itself to me to sound taps instead, which we did. The idea was taken up by others until a short time it was adapted by the entire army and TAPS is now looked upon as the most appropriate and touching part of a military funeral. I give you all this history to show you the remembrance, the importance of this holiday. It just, it's not just a fair my generation or your generation, it's for generations past. And yes, tomorrow is Memorial Day, but what comes to your mind when you think of Memorial Day? The beginning of summer vacation, barbecues in the backyard, family get-togethers. In many churches, Memorial Day is ignored because it's just, it's not one of the holy days of the church calendar. But I believe it is good for us to consider what Memorial Day really represents, for the very name calls for us to remember. This special day started at the end of the Civil War, and within a few years of practice, placing the flowers, it came to be bigger than we can imagine. But people are forgetful, and we, need, we often need to jog our memories. And in the Bible, we find that God has given us some reminders too. When you look at Genesis 9, 11, after God destroyed the earth in the flood, he told Noah, I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be cut off by waters of, the fl of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the, the earth. Then God said, I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. So every time we see a rainbow, it serves as a reminder of God's promise. Another memorial erected by when Joshua led the people to Israel. The priests stood in the middle of the riverbed until everyone crossed safely. And then while they were crossing, Joshua told the 12 men, one from each of the 12 tribes, to go to, into the riverbed and select 12 large stones. They brought these stones up on the riverbank and made a monument out of it. Then Joshua said, in the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. 
When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. See, there are special days and times in the Bible specifically designed to help us remember. I'm going to call your attention to three, just three of them this morning. And you probably know these stories, but listen again and see how God uses them to help us remember. The first is the festival of Passover. The people of Israel had been slaves and soldiers in Egypt for over 400 years. Then God told Moses, I want you to go back to Egypt and say to Pharaoh, let my people go. Moses did what God commanded, but Pharaoh refused to listen. So to reinforce his demand, God sent plague after plague upon Egypt. And every time when the plague was at its worst, Pharaoh would say, stop the plague and I'll let the people go. But even after plagues, Pharaoh would renege on his promises and continue their slavery. Finally, Moses said in Exodus 11, 4 through 6, there, this is what the Lord says. About midnight, I will go through Egypt. Every firstborn son in Egypt will die. There will be a loud wailing throughout Egypt, worse than there has ever been or ever will be again. God instructed the Israelites, each family is to choose a year-old lamb, one without spot or blemish, the best in every flock. You know, one of the things many have forgotten that is supposed to be offering our very best to God. Sadly, we tend to keep the best to ourselves and give God the leftovers. Yet the biblical principle has always been that God deserves our best. And if we love him, then we will give him our best. God told them in Exodus 12, 22, kill that lamb and drain its blood into a basin, then roast the lamb, but before you eat it, take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin, and put some of the blood on top and on both sides of the door frame. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, men, both men and animals, and I'll bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. It says in Exodus 12, 12 to 13. So someone in every Jewish home took hyssops, dipped it in the blood, and put it on the doorframe. And that night, just as God said, he brought judgment upon Egypt, and there was weeping and wailing throughout the land. But whenever God saw the blood of the lamb, those homes were spared. Exodus 12.33 tells us the next morning, the Egyptians urged the people to hurry and leave the country, for otherwise they said, we will all die. And after 400 years, they were free. God said, this is the day you commemorate. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as the festival to the Lord. Over 3,500 years have gone by, and every faithful Jew still celebrates. They still remember the Passover, and it's important that we don't forget either. It's important that we don't forget our Savior, how he's rescued us. It's times when we're in adversity that we forget. When we're in the middle of everything and it just seems like we can't take another step, we, were just, we feel defeated, deflated, and useless, but God is there saying, I am with you. I am here with you. Lean on me, not your own understanding. And it is so important that we follow the, you know, the traditions of the church. And I don't want people to confuse what I'm saying here. You need to have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But the traditions of the church, the ceremonies, are good to remember, to help us remember where we once were. This past week, I'm not going to lie, I've, I've felt overwhelmed. I felt under, I, like, I felt like I wasn't giving my very best to God. I was focusing more on what the enemy was saying to me than what God was saying to me. And I'll be honest, it stunk. You could sense that in yourself when you start listening to that. 
And my kids noticed it. My wife noticed it. My closest circle of friends noticed it. And, you know, and you have to, it's only something that you can work out together yourself. And so I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay, I need to not forget where I once was. Because see, where I once was, if all this stuff was happening to me and I was not saved and Jesus was not in my heart, I, I tell you, I would be probably an unbearable man. But I look at it and I say, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Because you know what? Satan sees me as a, a threat to his agenda. He sees me as a threat to causing his hate and discontent. Why? Because I know Jesus. I have Jesus living in my heart. I am the hands and feet of Jesus on this side of eternity, and I will be sharing hope with those that are out there. And I'm like, thank you. And it takes little things to make your blessings. Just little things that work out. Last Saturday, uh, Sunday night, we did our step up night. We had 20 kids show up, five of which have never been to youth group before. And you know what? We say amen to that. We shout to the proclaimed of the heavens. We say, thank you, Jesus, for that. And then a few days later, parents are texting us saying to Eric and I, you know what? Our kids had fun. It was a great time. Praise Jesus. See, those are the things that you need to hold on to. When you see that the world is trying to get you down, you find something that is really tangible that you can hold close to your heart. That those five kids were exposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those five kids were given the seed to be planted. Praise Jesus for that. Now, the second memorial that I want to mention this morning is our day of worship. It all started when God created the heavens and the earth. The Bible said God worked six days in creation, and on the seventh day he rested. Then God blessed the Sabbath day, the seventh day, and called it holy. The Ten Commandments, God told the Jews that they were to remember the Sabbath day, the seventh day, keep it holy, a day of rest and worship. If under God's old Jewish covenant, the seventh day of the week was to be kept holy, why did Christians living under the new covenant worship on the first day of the week? Well, let me mention a few things that make the first day of the week very special for Christians. First of all, Sunday, the first day, is special to Christians because when Jesus rose from the dead, his resurrection and his first six resurrection appearances were all on the first day of the week. Then 50 days later, after Jesus ascended back to heaven on the day of Pentecost, the first day of the week, the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles just as Jesus had promised. Peter preached the first gospel sermon to 3,000, responded, and were baptized, and the church was started. Soon, early, the early Christians were meeting regularly upon the first day of the week to worship God and encourage one another. And in the book of Revelation, the apostle John spoke of this day as the Lord's day. And so it is to those of us who gather to worship him. Now, I pray that we will always recognize that when we come together, we have come to meet a holy and righteous God, to remember what he has done for us and to rededicate ourselves to him. See, this is where we get together as a community. We get to lean on one another. Hey, how are your troubles going? Oh, I had a bad week. Well, let me pray for you, right? That's what we're all here about as a community. So the day of worship. And this is going to transition into a sermon series about worship. You know, because we always tell, what is worship? We sing songs like, here I am to worship. What's that mean? We'll, we'll unravel that in the next few weeks. The next one, finally, there's a meal of remembrance. It was the night before his crucifixion that Jesus met with his disciples in the upper room to celebrate the Passover together. And it was an evening of remembering as God had long commanded. But as they ate, Jesus, Jesus gave them something new, something greater to remember. See, for Jesus, he said, 
bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you in remembrance of me. In the, you know, we see that in 1 Corinthians 11, 24 through 25. Did you know why Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood? It was because Jesus was the fulfillment of prophecy that God had given centuries before the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31, 30, 31 through 34 says, The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. I will put their, my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. No longer were some ingredients of the Passover meal simply to be reminded, a reminder of their release from Egyptian slavery. Now the bread and the cup were to be internal reminders of Jesus, of his sacrifices, his love. That's why Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. When we do communion, it's just a symbolism. The grape juice is. There was a, there's a story once that said that there was a uh, pastor's kid once, and his dad went to go give blood for a blood drive. And he didn't come home at the right time because he was doing the after hours. And the little boy went up to his mom and said, Mom, you know, where's Daddy? She goes, oh, he's giving blood. He's out. The little boy thought he was out on visitation. He goes, oh, no, he's just giving out, you know, giving some blood. And he goes, they do know that it's just grape juice, right? <laughs> See, it's our perception. We do this in remembrance of him. But when Paul added... When he wrote about that, he added, whenever you eat this bread or drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So when you and I partake, we're proclaiming that I believe that Jesus lived and died and rose again, and he's my Savior and my Lord. I may not be able to speak eloquently about him, but I can proclaim my faith through these, these symbolisms, these emblems of faith, so I can partake in remembrance of him. And when Paul writes about the Lord's Supper, he said, it's not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a preparation in the blood of Christ, and it's not the bread we break a participation in the blood of Christ. 1 Corinthians 10, 15 through 16, because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. We have all traveled the same dusty road. We have sinned. We're not worthy. But we do not partake because we're worthy. We partake because God is holy and righteous and he invites us to come into his presence and be part of his memorial as we share it with each other. We have so much to re remember. Whatever you do, don't forget how you got here. Don't forget the price that has been paid and is being paid so that we can live in freedom and enjoy the blessings that God has given us. Please don't ever forget. We had 46 veterans and their wives on Thursday. We've averaged, the first time we did the veterans dinners, we had like 25 people. And I remember... I was like, man, there got to be more people. More people got to come to this. So what did we do? We prayed. The next night, the next month in February, we had to cancel it because the weather was too bad. So we had zero. And I was like, oh, dear God. I'm just, I want people to see your light through this ministry. Please bless this ministry. The march, we sold out. Had to start turning people away. April, we filled up again. Last month, we were, May, we almost filled it up again. And then we had to remind people, listen, don't come to Bolton next month expecting a meal because you'll, if you come on a Sunday morning, this is, it's worse than it is on a Sunday morning for riding parking. So we're going to pick it back up. But see, we provide hope for these people. These veterans, these people that gave their all so I could come up here and freely preach God's word. And we don't have to be in underground buildings scared for persecution. We could pre freely do it. Next month, we're going to be sending the sound system outside. The boys are going to set it all up and everything. We're going to be outside worshiping our Lord like, a, like the early ones, Israelites, with our tabernacle tents. 
<clears throat> our little pop-up tents that we have out there. We'll have our seats. We'll be freely worshiping the Lord out there. How awesome is that? We have to remember where we once were so we can continue moving forward. There's a story that is told of a young and successful executive named Josh. He was driving in a Chicago neighborhood. He was going a little too fast for his sleek black Jaguar, and, uh, which was only two months old. Now this, this story, for the young ones that are here, a Jaguar would be like a Tesla, okay? So we'll, we'll, we'll keep that in mind. But he was watching carefully for kids darting out in between parked cars and slowed down when he thought he saw something. And as car passed the spot, no child, no child darted out, but a brick flew out and hit his car, Jaguar, his brand new shiny door. And he slammed on his brakes and threw the gears in reverse and taking the Jaguar back to the spot where the brick had been thrown. He jumped out of the car, grabbed this kid and pushed him up against the parked car and he shouted, Who are you and what the heck are you doing? Building up a head of steam, he went on to berate the kid. He said, that's my new car. (coughs) The brick you threw is going to cost you a lot of money. Why did you throw it? The kid said, please, mister. I'm sorry. I didn't know what else to do. I threw the brick because no one would stop. And he had tears dripping down the boy's chin as he pointed around the parked car. It's my brother, mister, he said. He rolled off the curb, fell out of his wheelchair, and I can't pick him up. Would you please help me get him back into his wheelchair? He's hurt, and he's too heavy for me to lift. Moved beyond the words, the young executive tried desperately to swallow his rapidly swelling lump in his throat. Straining, he lifted the young man back into his wheelchair, took out his handkerchief, and wiped the scrapes and cuts, checking to see if everything else was okay. Then he walked with them to make sure the younger brother was able to get him back home all right. Then it was a long walk back to his sleek, black, shiny new car. And a long, slower walk. He never did fix that side door. He kept the dent to remind himself not to go through life so fast that someone has to throw a brick at him to get his attention again. Are you going through life so fast? that you're not paying attention to everything? Does God need to throw a brick at you to get you to slow down and look at what's around you? I was frustrated because we all have visions in our heads, right? And I had a certain vision the way I wanted things to be outside. And they weren't going the way my vision was in my head. And then a wise man came up to me and said, Pastor, it's just grass. Pastor, it's just concrete. Pastor, it's just money. What's more important is your testimony before men. After he said that to me and left, I went into my office and I cried. I cried for two reasons. One, if my daddy was still alive, I'd be going behind the woodshed. Even at 47 years old, that man would probably take me behind there because that's no way he brought me up. And secondly, I felt like I let my heavenly father down. Your testimony is the most valuable thing that you have. Cherish it. Because once it gets tarnished, it will be impossible to get it fixed. We need to be standing up in the light for God in a dark, dark society. God will throw every, God, Satan will throw everything that he has at his disposal to try to discourage you, dismay you. Don't let him. God always 
wins. He's 2-0 and oh right now. He won in the garden. He won on the cross in Calvary. And we just wait for that day to come back. So he'd be 3-0. and oh. There are some people that have graduated on to heaven before us. We're sad, but they're there. Memorial Day weekend always reminds me of Pastor Bubar because that's where he was laid to rest. On Saturday, I was walking through the cemetery and I looked down and I saw Bob Edwards' father's gravestone. And I was like, wow. So we fixed that. And then I happened to look over and I see a picture of Mr. Kolbeck right there on his grave looking at me. And I just looked back at it, went over there and talked to him. I think the workers on the other side of the fence there thought I was a little crazy. But I was talking to him. And I'll tell you this. I have a peace knowing that I will be reunited with that man again. I have a peace with all those that have gone before us that were Christians, I'll be reunited with them again. If you're here this morning or watching online without Jesus Christ as your Savior, don't wait for someone to throw a brick to get your attention. I invite you to come and accept him as your Lord and Savior. I ask you to come speak with me. Because this is the time. We need to stand up. We can't take every moment for granted. Brother Mike, would you close us in prayer and dismiss everyone, please?